Now we will uh, go to uh, our last speaker, uh, Jon Peter Sante, uh, who will discuss inferior uh, oblique uh, anterior nasal transpositioning. Uh, and Jon Peter is uh, a famous uh, strabismologist and pediatric ophthalmologist from Copenhagen, Denmark. Jon Peter, please. So, uh, welcome to uh, the talk on uh, inferior oblique nasal enter nasal transposition. My name is Jon Peter Sounde and I work in Copenhagen and I thanks to my my um, colleagues in Copenhagen for preparing this talk with me. I do have financial disclosure not relevant to this talk. So I would like to share a case with you. This is a seven year old boy. He has infantile isotropia DVD and he has normal visual acuity. And even though he has infantile isotropia he has actually quite a nice stereo acuity. He had uh, prior to coming to our clinic, bilateral medial rectus recessions, bilateral super recessions. And because of incompetence, he had a left super uh, recession, uh, less left super rectus antiposition uh, afterwards. So this is when he presented to us with a 30 degrees head tilt to the right shoulder. And when you look at this boy, he has a left hypertropia in primary and he does not have a very big inferior oblique overaction and looking at side gaze he's um, is quite well aligned but he has something wrong with the left eye who does not go down so to try to understand what's going on with this kid we look at him uh, here he has a head tilt when we close his right eye he's not focusing with the left he still has a head tilt but when he focuses with the right eye, his head tilt seems, seems to get less. So maybe the left eye is driving the head tilt. So we try to find out how much exactly torsion does he has. Well, dogmatics in children is not very easy, but it seems he has an excyclo torsion. And we'll look at the fundi. We can see here there is a left exactly torsion at least 15 degrees or more. So to try to understand what's going on here, this is what happens if you have a, a one eye uh, with excyclic torsion here demonstrated in the right eye. And how can we compensate to take care of this? Well, if you turn the head to the opposite shoulder, the two eyes will be aligned. So if you have some excyclic torsion in one eye, by tilting your head, the eyes can work together again. So we believe that's what's going on with this kid. And our question is now, how do we take care of this uh, torsion and head tilt in this boy? Well, we could take care of the exactly torsion with a Harada Ijo suture, a Harada Ijo technique. We wanted to do that. But when we looked at this left eye, uh, the super oblique was so scarred and not available for surgery, unfortunately. So what options do, do, does this leave us with now? Well, we could do the inferior rectus nasal transposition. We can move the, we could uh, work on the inferior oblique is in both eyes with a myectomy, a transposition, or we could move the inferior oblique nasally and anteriorly, the IOM uh, procedure. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So if you want to work on the inferior oblique muscle, if you make a normal inferior oblique transposition, this is a eye, right eye seen from below. Then we move <clears throat> the inferior oblique muscle from the, the temporal part of the eye, move it inferiorly. Now the eyes, um, and you can suture here on the temporal side of the inferior rectus. You can even uh, put it, it further forward. So it will actually work as a depressor. And what happens if, is if you move the eye nasally, the, the inferior oblique nasally, the, the muscle will completely change the, the way it works from before an excyclotorter and uh, elevator. Now it's actually a depressor and intorter. And the reason why that happens is that the cardiovascular bundle uh, holding onto the inferior oblique here in this uh, picture as yellow, will actually be the insertion, the way the, 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 um, the, the way the muscle acts with the pulls. And we found that if you 
do the inferior oblique inter anterior nasal transposition, this will actually correct 15 to 25 personal vertical deviation in primary. So uh, before we do this uh, uh, surgery, we need to check how tight are the inferior oblique and super oblique muscles. So we push the eye into the orbit. And by doing this, you can actually test the tightness of the muscles. And we put the numbers, the excitable torsion of both eyes on the whiteboard in the operation room. And in, in these cases, when you want to see how tight the super and oblique, inferior oblique muscles are, um, it's important to put the numbers on at once so you don't mix them up. So we wanted to do the inferior oblique nasal transposition. And I didn't do this uh, surgery my, myself before. So I traveled to India and met a good friend, Pradip Sharma, and sh he showed me how to do this. And what he showed me is that if you take the inferior oblique and uh, cut it uh, from the original insertion, it's possible to suture it when you hold the, the end of the muscle up here. And sorry for the um, blurry image, but what we do is we make a nasal opening in the conjunctiva. Uh, the muscle is sitting here temporarily, but we want to place it here nasally. And then you can actually grab a, a forceps and pull the muscle all the way nasally over here. So by doing this, we suture the inferior oblique, which was originally sitting here. Now we suture it here on the nasal side. And what happens is that this changes the muscle's um, direction uh, completely. So let's go, to, uh, go back to our seven-year-old boy. This is after the surgery, one year after surgery of the left inferior oblique. And if you look at him here, <clears throat> he has now the, the head tilt is, is only five degrees. And, um, his, um, his author in primary and has uh, nice uh, ductions and versions. So if you want to correct the large inferior oblique overactions like in congenital fourth nerve palsies, like in this gentleman, we have a very large hyper, right hyperphora in primary, which turns even more in, in left side gaze. So if you want to correct this uh, large deviation, usually you need to do a two muscle surgery. Problem is if you do a inferior oblique muscle surgery here, and then the inferior rectus on this eye, you will have problems in the ipsilateral gaze and have overcorrection this side. So we did an inferior oblique overaction, no, uh, inferior oblique um, anterior cell transposition. And this is the patient a few weeks after the uh, surgery, which took care of the large overaction um, and side gaze. So we looked at this technique for some time and we found that uh, if we do the inferior oblique uh, anterior nasal transposition, uh, at baseline, we changes um, the deviation up to 21 uh, present treatment doctors. And uh, the inferior oblique overaction can be reduced by uh, 2.6 on a scale from zero to four. And mostly, which is important is that if you do this inferior oblique nasal transposition, we can also correct exactly torsion up to nine degrees. So are there any risks and problems doing this? What about anti-elevation after ION? Well, we know that from other studies, if you do inferior oblique transposition, up to 15% of the patients might have anti elevation syndrome. But in our cases, with 55 patients, we only found two patients had this and they needed a reoperation. That's a 4%. So, what we found in our group was that we use inferior oblique uh, and anterior nasal transposition for inferior oblique overactions, grade three to four. We use it to correct exocycle torsion, hypertropia, and we always use adjustable sutures so we can fine tune the amount of uh, vertical and torsional correction in the surgery. It's a one muscle procedure, gives an average nine degrees correction of exocycle torsion, and it produces on average 21 prism diopters decrease in vertical deviation and it decreases the inferior oblique overaction at average 2.6 in the zero, zero to four degree uh, scale. 
Last thing I want to share with you is um, our whiteboard with, from the, for the operation room, which we use for all the cases. And we use this document and to try to get an uh, overview of all the complex cases. And we also use this to, to uh, discuss, if we need to discuss difficult cases, we can use this uh, condensated um, chart, medical chart for, for the patients. And we have made this available for you if you want to use it. Uh, it's a whiteboard uh, printed um, uh, whiteboard. So the pattern here, the, the layout can be downloaded for free. And um, you can, uh, it's a PowerPoint version, so you can change anything to your uh, discretion, which, which works with you and your clinic. But please be useless if you want to. And if you have any questions, please see me. Uh, thank you, uh, Jon Peter. <clears throat> uh, uh, this is an uh, interesting uh, technique. I, th I think the first time I heard uh, uh, of it was by um, David uh, Steger, uh, Steger Jr. Is, uh, or Steger uh, uh, Sr. Uh, um, about 15 years ago, I think. But I, uh, uh, I, I find it uh, an, uh, interesting uh, and quite um, delicate uh, surgery. Uh, uh, what is interesting is that you uh, did not get any, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, adherence, uh, uh, adherence syndromes, at, at least uh, uh, far less than you would have in, uh, in uh, other cases. Uh, how important was this conjunctival bridge <clears throat> you showed uh, uh, from that uh, case uh, who was operated in, uh, in India. Uh, does that help to, uh, to avoid um, adherence syndrome? Thank you, Anjan. I think that's a very good question. I, um, in India, actually, Pradeep Sharma made a full limbal opening to, uh, to okay. move the uh, muscle. Uh, the video, actually, the videos I would have shown you, which didn't work, that's you know, how it was only photos. Yeah. Um, these, th this is how we do it in Copenhagen, where we make a small uh, fornix incision mm -hmm. and a small fornix incision nasally, and we make the uh, tunnel under the conjunctiva, but the, on the inferior side of the inferior, inferior rectus. And I, I believe you can have, sorry. So underneath, so you pull the inferior uh, oblique underneath the inferior rectus. Yes, away from the eye, from yeah. on the on the orbital side of the inferior rectus. Okay. The inferior yeah. rectus is closest to the eye, and then the inferior yes. oblique travels uh, on the orbital oh. side yeah, yeah. nasally. Yeah. Yes. So um, we were very worried about the anti elevation syndrome. I actually discussed it with Bert Kushner a few years ago, and he said you you need to be careful because this will produce anti-elevation syndrome. Uh, and we were looking very carefully for this and we found this in two patients now in the 55 patients group. Mm -hmm. So it, it can happen, but what we did in these two cases was to, to loosen the sutures, the adjustable sutures uh, on, the, on the nasal side, and then we could avoid the anti-elevation. Yeah, how long follow-up do you have on these patients? Yes, we have been doing this now for three years. So uh, in the group here, I think uh, the follow-up is down to one month, but some of them we now have three, three years of follow-up on. And, and we usually after six months, we, we, we leave them and we tell them to come back if they have uh, problems and we haven't seen any of those late overcorrections or undercorrections. But I, I'd like to come with, uh, answer one more question to Jan Tiers comment on the yeah. anti-elevation syndrome because doing the inferior oblique surgery uh, for me changed dramatically the moment I, I try, began to use the Helveston Barbie retractor. I don't know if you know this instrument, which I is know, a yes. nice instrument and you can hold the uh, conjunctiva and the tenons away from the eye and you have room to see, visualize the insertion of the inferior oblique and you can neatly cauterize and cut it without all the orbital fat coming up into the field. And after we began using this instrument, we had much, much better results. Yeah, it's, uh, when you can see what you do, that's always very helpful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
you've, you've done a big series, uh, John. Uh, what do you think other surgeons are doing for these patients with similar problems? What are the alternative managements? Well, for the excitotorsion, of course, the Harada Ido or the inferior rectus transposition, um, for the grade three and four inferior oblique overactions, usually people do a two muscle procedure with the inferior oblique transposition or myectomy, and then go on the other eye to take, do the inferior rectus recession. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the, the interesting part about this surgery is you have only, it, it's a one muscle surgery and it seems to be quite, quite self-adjusting. So we've been surprised that it's, we have so few re-operations in these and uh, it seems to, to, to give us what we need. So, so the, the patients are very diverse, but this seems to, to take care of this in a good way. And another thing we found as, as an as a, um, alternative to Harada Ito, it, it helps us because the Harada Ito seems to, seems to unwind over time. We know that when you tighten the superior oblique, it will go looser and then you lose some of the torsional effect. But this is a this is a this is not a paretic muscle. So when you put it on, mm. it stays working this way. How, how much of the effect do you think is from disinserting an overall active inferior oblique, and how much from the reinsertion side? Exactly. I think I think that's a very good point. And I think actually this takes you have both advances here. You you get rid of the overaction. And you also use the muscle as an active force. When you do a myectomy, you just get rid of it, the muscle and you don't need it anymore. But here we can actually take advantage of the muscle pulling the opposite way to, to pull the eye down if you have very severe overaction. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very uh, much. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience, not from other uh, participants, uh, panelists? If not, then uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody for uh, uh, their uh, presentations, uh, attentions and questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank my co-moderator John Sloper and the ESA for uh, um, supplying half of the uh, speakers. And uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank the uh, IPOS, the International Pediatric Ophthalmology Society uh, uh, and Strabismus uh, Council for uh, uh, the other three uh, presenters. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And as mentioned before, uh, you can uh, see all of this back uh, uh, at the SOE uh, website uh, and on the YouTube uh, channel if you have missed something or tell your uh, colleagues that they missed something, then they can see what they missed. Thank uh, you very much. Also, also, please remember there will be a short survey available immediately after this. Please do give us your feedback. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.